A man opens his mouth to bite a hot dog and suddenly freezes. His eyes widen, and the hot dog drops from his hand, falling to the ground. Ahead, a stampede of people is running toward him, screaming, crying out for help. Behind them, a man walks at an ordinary, casual pace, but something is off. His eyes have a glazed, unfocused look to them, and he keeps shoveling random items into his open mouth, swallowing them down. He eats a clipboard and pen, a discarded shoe, and as the first man watches in horror, the very hungry man grabs the ankle of a fallen member of the crowd and pulls him into his mouth, devouring him. The first man turns to run for his life, only to be knocked to the ground by the rest of the crowd, trying to escape. He struggles to climb back to his feet, and a hand reaches out to take his. When he makes it to his feet, he looks up and sees the hungry man pulling him in, mouth stretching open wide. The sky is a perfect, cloudless blue. The air is warm from the unbroken sunlight, but cooled to the perfect temperature by a gentle breeze, and there is a sense of electricity, excitement, and competition in the air. Throngs of people have gathered together in a makeshift arena, piled into plastic chairs and swarming around concession stands, all training their eyes on the arena's center. What are they here for? Some sort of Olympic Games? A baseball tournament? A horse race? No, it's something greater, something meatier. It is the annual Midsummer Hot Dog Eating Contest, and locals and tourists alike are coming together to see just who can cram the most pork or beef hot dogs and buns down their gullets in front of a roaring crowd. The announcer makes his way to the front of the arena, standing with his arms wide in front of the long table behind him. As he calls out the names of this year's contestants, they file in, each taking his place behind the table. There is the previous year's champion, a burly man with a bushy beard and twinkling eyes, and there is this year's surprise competitor, a skinny 19-year-old college student with a hungry grin. Then there are the lesser-known contestants, a local father who signed up after making a joke with his daughter, an uncle who scrawled his name on the sign-up sheet after a few too many drinks, a recently retired man checking off another item on his golden year's bucket list. All have come to the event today with full hearts and empty stomachs, ready to see who the year's victor will be. The announcer riles up the crowd, encouraging them to cheer as loudly as possible to spur on their chosen competitor. All the while, staff are carrying out trays piled high with hot dogs, more hot dogs than most people see in a year, except for the people who just really, really love hot dogs. Each contestant receives a tray of hot dogs, a bucket of water, and an additional empty bucket, just in case, well, you get the idea. With the supplies and competitors all in place, it is time to begin the countdown. The announcer holds up his favorite air horn and calls out, Three, two, one, eat! At the sound of the air horn's blast, the men leap into action, seizing hot dogs from plates and each engaging in their unique competitive eating technique. The previous year's champion employs the method of famous hot dog eating champion Joey Chestnut, dunking his entire hot dog sloppily into his water, then swallowing it as quickly as possible. The new challenger, on the other hand, employs the Solomon method, named for King Solomon. Much like the fabled king suggested doing with a stolen infant, eaters using the Solomon method break the focus of their feasting in half before polishing it off. One of the more casual competitors attempts a divide-and-conquer technique, eating first the dog itself and then the bun. Others employ no specific technique at all, attempting to devour the stack of hot dogs before them, using the same classic eating style they might employ at a family barbecue. This is a grave mistake. One by one, the less prepared competitors drop out, spitting into their buckets, wiping meat sweats from their foreheads, waddling out of the arena while groaning and holding their aching stomachs. Soon, only the two front runners remain. But what's this? A challenger approaches. An unassuming black man, clad in a shirt and dress pants, rushes into the arena, his face a mask of single-minded determination, and begins seizing the discarded hot dogs off the table, gobbling them up as fast as he can. The announcer and the rest of the audience watch in stunned disbelief. This is unprecedented, and as exciting as it is, definitely against the rules. This man is not a registered competitor, and he certainly can't join the contest in the champion stretch. Unsure of what else to do, the announcer beckons to the staff on the sidelines, ushering them back toward the table to clear the food and escort this surprise drop-in out of the arena. The audience watches with rapt attention as the staff members attempt to remove the stranger from his place at the table. He shakes his head violently, refusing to go, and snatches the hot dogs away from them even as they try to clear the trays away. All the while, the remaining competitors standing are attempting to stay the course and finish strong in spite of the interruption. 
The new, younger man collapses, slumping down onto the table in a hot dog-induced stupor. He has tapped out. The victor is the previous year's champion, with a staggering ultimate tally of 38 hot dogs. As four staff members work together to wrestle the stranger out of the arena, the champion steps forward to receive his trophy. The crowd roars as he holds up his arms, grinning ear to ear and basking in yet another win. The announcer can still see the staff struggling with the stranger out of the corner of his eye, but this crowd wants to see their champion crown, and the show must go on. So he grabs the Hot Dog King sash, the crown made from gold, well, gold-plated, hot dogs, and even the massive gold trophy. He crowns the winner, placing the sash over his shoulders. Then, as the music swells triumphantly, courtesy of the local high school marching band, the announcer holds up the trophy, sunlight glinting off its shiny surface. It represents so many things, achievement, celebration, the ability to eat just so much meat and not get sick, and now it is time for it to be awarded to the man who earned it. The announcer stretches his arms, handing over the trophy to the contest winner, when all of a sudden, another hand grabs hold of its handle, ripping it from the announcer's grasp. The stranger has returned, somehow freeing himself from the multiple security guards who escorted him away, and he has taken the trophy for himself. But he isn't just attempting to crown himself the hot dog king. No, this is not a simple coup de hot dog. He lifts the trophy up over his head, opening his mouth as wide as it will go, and tears the metal in half with a horrible screeching sound, shoving the pieces into his mouth, chewing and swallowing. By the time the announcer and the champion recover from their shock enough to move again, the trophy is completely gone, vanished into the stranger's belly. After a day of seemingly impossible feats of feasting, the sight of this strange man consuming a truly impossible meal of metal is just too much for the already anxious crowd to take. The arena erupts into absolute chaos as people spill out of their seats en masse, fleeing the area. The champion, however, does not turn and run. He feels robbed of his victory. Though it may have occurred in an utterly bizarre fashion, he won't stand for this kind of disrespect. He has trained all year for this moment, only to watch his trophy be eaten right in front of him. He marches right up to the stranger and pokes him in the chest, demanding to know who he thinks he is, what gives him the right to crash the hot dog eating contest, interrupt the proceedings, and upstage his victory by chowing down on the trophy. The man doesn't answer him, so the champion continues to berate him, wagging his finger in his face. The stranger's eyes follow the finger, and slowly he opens his mouth. There is a sudden chop, and the champion screams, holding his hand to his chest, using his shirt to stem the bleeding. He turns to run with the rest of the crowd, but it's too late. The stranger's hand clamps down on his shoulder, holding him in place with a surprising strength. The only thing he sees before his life is snuffed out is the stranger's wide-open mouth, before everything goes dark with another sickening chomp. All the while, the crowd's terror rises to a fever pitch at the horrible sight. They trample each other as they scramble to vacate the area, shoving strangers and loved ones alike out of the way in a bid to escape this mysterious equal opportunity omnivore with an appetite for far more than just hot dogs. Some manage to escape, running far enough from the arena that they can stop to catch their breaths and glance back at the ones who were not so lucky. Those who tripped and fell in the madness, who had the wind knocked out of them by an elbow to the gut from one of their neighbors, those with weak ankles or who hadn't tied their shoes carefully enough. All of these poor, unfortunate souls are next on the menu for the stranger. He devours them one by one, rarely even stopping to chew. As one surviving woman watching from a distance pulls out her phone to call 911, she can't escape noticing the parallels to the contest itself, the way the stranger eats with a singular focus on consuming as much as possible. There's no pause to enjoy the meal, but there is no sadism or malice in the act either, just the sheer, undeniable drive to keep eating. The woman's call to the police is one of the strangest moments of her life and utterly baffles the local police department. Ma'am, please calm down, one officer repeats again and again. What do you mean there's a man eating people? I mean exactly what I said, she shouts. A man showed up at the hot dog contest and started eating people. Please, you have to do something. I think this is above our pay grade, miss, another officer chimes in. You think we should call, you know, the first officer trails off. Who? Who? the woman demands, but the line goes dead before she can ask another question. The police are clearly no help, and she isn't about to stick around and see just how big this stranger's appetite is. She tried to save the others, but now she needs to save herself. She runs all the way home without another glance back. Meanwhile, the local police did make that mysterious call, and an SCP Foundation mobile task force is currently en route to the scene. By the time they arrive, 
the park is a ghost town, with nothing but the blood-stained grass and abandoned arena to suggest that something horrible ever happened here at all. But these aren't some bumbling local police officers who have no idea what to do with a man-eating anomaly. This team has seen enough bizarre sights to fill a lifetime, and another lifetime after that. They spy a trail of sticky red footprints leading away from the arena. At first, they assume that the substance is blood, but a closer examination reveals that it is, in fact, ketchup. They track the savory footprints away from the scene of the day's unsavory events, following them to a nearby warehouse. Judging from the scattered wooden beams, rustling metal, and boarded-up windows, this place has been abandoned for some time. The perfect place for an anomaly to hide away. If they weren't certain, the sound of someone inside biting through sheets of metal is plenty of indication that this is the right place. With no time to waste, they break down the door of the warehouse, weapons drawn and ready. They follow the sound of the chewing, splitting up to apprehend the subject from all available directions. The shriek of tearing metal echoes through the building, bouncing off the walls and creating a cacophony that is difficult to track. They do their best to follow the sound, but quickly veer off in separate directions in an attempt to cover as much ground as possible. One operative confronts the stranger just as he is reaching for another piece of metal. He watches as the man takes a massive bite out of the steel, a bite that should have shattered his teeth and broken his jaw. Instead, a cartoonish bite mark is taken out of the metal. He approaches the stranger, who, upon locking eyes with him, begins to shake his head, still chewing. The MTF operative ignores this visual cue, approaching the man and attempting to physically restrain him. This, like the confrontation with the champion before, is cut off with a fateful chomp and the operative screams ringing out through the warehouse, alerting his teammates to his unfortunate fate. The screams suddenly go silent and another MTF operative stops cold, listening as the sound of chewing draws nearer and nearer. He spins around to face the presence behind him and spots the stranger standing there. The otherwise ordinary man is polishing off the tip of a steel beam, grimacing as he swallows it. The operative lifts his weapon, pointing it at the subject. The operative tells him to stand down and come quietly. The hungry man pleads wide-eyed for the operative to turn and run while he still can. He takes small, reluctant steps toward the operative, muttering that he can't stop. The operative brandishes his weapon again, barking another order for the man to stop. Before he can make another move, the stranger snatches the weapon out of his hand, opens his mouth, and swallows it. He winces as he does, but does not stop until the weapon is completely devoured. All at once, he lets out a loud belch, his knees buckle, and he slumps to the ground. He rubs his stomach, wipes his brow, and sighs heavily. I'm so sorry about that. I was just so hungry I couldn't help it. The man shakes his head sadly. I hope you can get a new weapon. And I'm sorry about your friend, too. You said you couldn't help it. Why'd you stop? The stranger shrugs, sighs again, and simply says, Well, because I was full. After a bit of convincing, and a test confirming that the subject's strength and bite force has returned to ordinary human levels, the remaining mobile task force agree to bring him into Foundation custody unharmed, though restrained. They pile into one of the SCP Foundation's trademark unmarked vans and set off toward the nearest Foundation site. About one hour into the trip, the subject begins to lament his growling stomach, asking if they could possibly stop somewhere for a bite to eat. Ordinarily, this is against protocol, but after what happened to their teammate, the task force members aren't taking any chances. They pull into a fast food drive through and permit the subject to order whatever he wants. They'll declare it as a business expense later. Five burgers, five fries, five tacos, five pies, five cokes, ten tater tots, ten tenders, five shakes, five pancakes, five jalapeno poppers, and five baked potatoes later, the task force successfully reached the Foundation site with their newest subject, SCP-913. SCP-913 appears to be an average African-American man around middle age. Though his appearance is completely ordinary, his metabolism is unnaturally fast. He requires the recommended daily caloric intake for an average human being every two hours and has an unusually high internal temperature, though the specific number has been redacted from his official file. If he does not meet his calorie requirement for a given two-hour period, he will enter a trance state in which he is unable to control himself. In this state, he will break down and ingest any solid matter in his line of sight. This includes matter that would ordinarily be indigestible, including wood, plastic, and metal. In this state, his appetite does not distinguish between living and non-living subjects. When he is in this hunger-driven state, he is aware of all his actions, but cannot stop himself, even when he eats dense materials that cause him extreme discomfort. 
If this state hits while the subject is sleeping, he will be forced awake. In addition to his anomalous appetite, SCP-913 can rend objects at an estimated force of 3,000 newtons and can bite objects with an estimated force of 5,000 newtons when eating them. Whenever he is not in his trance state, he cannot replicate this strength. An examination of SCP-913's liver tissue showed that it is capable of producing new enzymes in response to foreign material, allowing his body to digest matter that should be highly dangerous to consume. These enzymes metabolize the substrate at an efficiency of approximately 98%, detoxifying any drugs or toxins consumed by the subject during the hunger state or otherwise. This includes, but is not limited to, amnestics and anesthetics. When SCP-913 was first discovered, he was wearing a shirt and dress pants, both with the brand name Doctor's Orders sewn onto their tags. SCP-913 has no tattoos aside from one on his right calf, which reads, Mr. Hungry, from Little Misters by Dr. Wondertainment. Just in case you aren't aware, the Little Misters are a line of humanoid anomalies created by the mysterious Dr. Wondertainment Corporation, including the fish-headed Mr. Fish, the candy-coated Ms. Sweetie, and Mr. Life and Mr. Death, who is every bit as existentially upsetting as he sounds. The purpose of these creations is currently unknown, though, like many Dr. Wondertainment products, their existence invites endless speculation. SCP-913 must be contained in a customized humanoid containment cell lined with one meter thick carbon steel. 913 is to be provided standard furnishings for his containment cell, coinciding with the usual necessities for a comfortable humanoid dwelling. He may be given pre-recorded entertainment materials, such as concerts, films, and television shows upon request. The cell may be accessed via a reinforced carbon steel door. Once every two hours, SCP-913 is provided with one nutritional supplement as specified in Document 913-2. I attempted to locate a copy of 913-2 for further details on said nutritional supplement, but access to it appears to be limited to researchers assigned to SCP-913. While the subject is sleeping, nutrition is provided to SCP-913 via a central venous catheter that must be changed once every three months. These measures allow SCP-913 to receive the calories that he needs to avoid entering a hunger state, ensuring the safety of everyone on site as well as his own comfort. Like the rest of the Little Misters, SCP-913 presents a puzzle that may never be solved. I could spend my limited time on this earth wondering why Dr. Wondertainment would create a being that seems to serve no purpose other than eating as much as possible, lest he unwillingly destroy the environment around him, but I believe that would be a waste of time. Why does Dr. Wondertainment do anything that they do? Why create a woman who can turn men into candy soldiers? Why create an ordinary man with a fish head, a tiny top hat, and a Boston accent? The personal motivations of Dr. Wondertainment, whether they are an individual or a massive conglomerate, are as inscrutable to me as the meaning of life itself, or the reasons why a person would want to eat more than two hot dogs in one sitting. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like Dr. Wondertainment's Custom Pets.